Welcome to Bitcoin Center Radio, recorded live from downtown Miami's expanding business district. Welcome, guys, to episode six of Bitcoin Center Miami Radio. Today, we are joined by two very special guests, Nick Spanos and Jeffrey Wernick. Uh, Nick doesn't really need an introduction around here. You guys are probably familiar with him. He's an early Bitcoin pioneer and the uh, founder of the original Bitcoin Center in New York City. Started that all the way back in 2013. And Jeffrey Wernick, for those of you guys who don't know, uh, he's a successful entrepreneur and a seasoned private investor in various asset classes. Um, he's also known as a strong believer and an early investor in Bitcoin. So Nick will be interviewing Jeff here. Thank you guys both so much for joining us. And uh, Nick, take it away. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for listening in. I have uh, the world famous Jeffrey Wernick on, and uh, I think uh, even more people should listen to Jeffrey. That's why we invite him in, invited him on. I want to ask a few questions, and we'll see where it goes here. So, Jeffrey, how would you describe yourself in this uh, day and age? How do I describe myself in this day and age? <laughs> when, it's, when it's first, I think quick, I'm not, I'm not very famous at all. But uh, as far as how I describe myself in this day and age, I think I, I vacillate between being somewhere in the range of a, between an anarchist and a libertarian. I think I'm probably more closer to a minarchist and an anarchist than a libertarian. I think that my perception of the role of government is probably a significantly smaller role, you know, than advocated by people in the Libertarian Party. So that's kind of like how I uh, have described myself. Well, very nice. So the reason why I said this day and age is because uh, for myself, my self-perception or the way I identify myself changes here and there or gets tweaked. And uh, maybe some things I wasn't able to admit to earlier i could admit to now <laughs> so uh that's why i asked it that way so um you're a very knowledgeable person and we want you to explain to us in this day and age meaning right now with covid i know it's uh you know it sounds clicheish now but uh because so many people are talking about covid but everyone's locked in their house at the moment and we're wondering what effects do you think it's having uh, it's had, it's having, and it's going to have in our future, in our uh, being, and uh, in our mindsets. Well, I'll tell you what I think the lesson should be learned from, from uh, this COVID experience is it should reinforce the message. Unfortunately, this is being drowned out because there are so many people who are vetting and controlling content, who are defining who authority figures are and basically drowning in anyone who doesn't meet their definition of an authority figure. So I'm referring to either government spokespeople or these organizations like the W World Health Organization or Facebook or Twitter or Google that basically they've determined to ramp up their censorship so that you basically rely upon who they designate as trusted third parties. So given what they've been successful at doing is what they've been successfully doing is a basically what government probably does better than anything else. Probably the only thing government does really well is sell fear, okay? So the government is very, very good at selling and provoking fear. So it's really expert at that, and it's probably the only thing that the government does efficiently. So what we have like here is an environment is is that these big centralized institutions want to reinforce the message that we should all live in fear of each other, okay? And that the only source of knowledge that is authoritarian in nature in the sense that the only place we should trust are these trusted third parties. So this is like an effort to destroy and uh, a complete destruction of basically getting information from channels you know, that are not either government channels or, or channels that are basically in partnership with channels and therefore uh, working uh, in concert, you know, to ban content that doesn't meet the criteria of these trusted third parties. So what 
you know, to what, you know, one of the things that lessons of people who got early involved in, or even later involved in the Bitcoin community uh, should have been the fact is that there was a discussion about the fact of, you know, what, what we're trying to do is coming up with alternatives to intermediating trusts, uh, that we intermediate trust in a peer basis in the absence of a trusted third party, that we rely upon is a ledger that cannot be manipulated, a ledger that's recording everything, a letter that we a ledger that we trust how it's being recorded, and that everybody has access to the same information at the ledger. So there's no information asymmetry, and that ledger is immutable. And nobody can mutate it or change it or edit it or doctor it up. So trust is becoming a protocol rather than somebody saying, you know, gee, I've built this reputation, and so I build this reputation. Just trust what I say without the need of verification. Just the fact that I'm saying it and I am who I am should be sufficient for you. Whether I am the SEC or, or Donald Trump or Mr. Xi or Macron or Merkel or the head of the SEC or the head of the FDA or the head of the WHO, they all have nice credentials. Some of them have letters after their name, PhD, MD, fucking asshole, you know, whatever letters that come after their name. And supposedly, we're supposed to just listen to them, not look outside them for answers, and just rely upon answers for them. And now we're amping up in that. What I think, if we would have had a ledger that we trusted, so in other words, if the beginning of whatever crisis that happened from wherever it started, you know, let's just say for the sake of argument that it began in China and Wuhan for whatever reason. If we had a ledger where that information was available to all of us, and if we could have been able to have the information to track it, instead of having just a few bureaucrats, either Bill Gates or WHO or Fauci or Burks and Trump and a couple of people saying we got the information, you know, because you have to think about every, every authority figure was completely wrong. You know, and when, when, when the information first came out, people doing these estimates of how many people would be, would have the virus and how many deaths we had, you know, we were getting numbers of, you know, there'd be millions and millions, millions of people dead. So when that number was first released, nobody was really going out and saying, well, let me vet these numbers and analyze where you got your data from. You know, they were not following, you know, procedures that you would go through for peer review publications. And matter of fact, in all of science, all of science, the whole concept of peer review is also in a state of crisis because supposedly from the scientific method, the scientific method means that if I do a stuff, if I do something, uh, that all the results should be reproducible. And we're finding that in most, in many peer reviewed publications, the results are not reproducible. So most peer reduced science journals are more science fiction than science fact. So what have, what have we gotten most in this process? We've gotten science fiction and not science fact. Because science fact means it's reproducible and nothing has been reproducible. So all we have is either science fiction or science speculation. So when the initial studies came out, the initial studies should have said, here's a warning label. Okay, here's the data. Go out and you validate and test what I'm doing and test my assumptions, you know, and see how I came up with what I came up with and challenge it, you know, because really all I'm doing is speculating. So... Look through how I'm thinking this issue through. Don't believe the final number. So that's what they should have said. There should have been that warning label on every study. Because the initial studies, there was almost no data. Uh, and whatever data there was, nobody even knew how good the data was, you know, that, that was being used. So all these, all these, you know, I find it humorous that when you take a look at like Twitter and, and Facebook, you know, and how they describe harmful misinformation. Can you imagine what information is more harmful misinformation than the early studies that were produced, you know, that caused this whole world to lock down under the fear of an expectation, you know, that if the whole world didn't lock down, everyone would be dead. Now we have examples of countries that have locked not that have not locked down and we're finding like the comparison being done between Norway and Sweden. And we're finding that, uh, that the results of basically of how many people and the incidence of, of the virus and deaths is statistically, uh, is not statistically different. So what we're so far, we don't necessarily have any clear data that says the level of social distancing, the lock quarantines, the lockdowns, you know, have really 
save significant lives. So we had, you know, now with, at least with some countries didn't close down like others, and we're seeing is the outcomes have not not been statistically significantly different. You know what we have learned, and we learned this pretty early on, is that there is this, there's there's an element of society, you know, that seems to be more susceptible to dying as a result of the virus because they have other health conditions that might make this virus more lethal to them than it does to the population at large. So did we really need to lock down the economy? You know, probably not. I don't think so. But what we had, we had is basically an environment of just fear through the institutions that were selling fear, really rather than rational discourse. And anyone who would disagree with these lines were labeled as people just wanting to murder people, serial killers, assassins, fake scientists. So all they had was aspersions to intimidate them, you know, from not participating, you know, in the, uh, in the marketplace for ideas. So what we, sh- what we sh- hopefully will have learned from this experience, you know, is don't trust any fucking authority figure, okay? They're all fucking liars. And to the extent that they're all not, they're all fucking liars, we clearly had a systemic problem, okay, where if the information was there and we got to look at it ourselves, my bet is if we had the information at the same time every fucking asshole in government had the information, okay, we collectively or individually would have made better, better decisions, quicker decisions than they did, and we wouldn't have had this economic destruction we have seen. As a, re- as a result of incomplete information, centralized authority control over its dissemination, which have all proved to be wrong, and the purveyors of fear and panic. So rather than, rather than rational thought, reason, and discussion. So I hopefully, you know, I, I have, in the, in the few talks that I've given, for the, for the few people I've been exposed to the, few, the words that I've said, I've, I've said for a couple of years now, that basically the big fork in the road is the way I see it is between do we trust centralized institutions or we begin to say we don't trust the centralized centralized institutions and we need a trust revolution and a trust revolution should be about distributing trust rather than concentrating trust and I hope that this is the discussion that we see going forward is what we should really think is we have a systemic failure of how we intermediate trust, and we need a revolution on how we intermediate trust. And it's not, it's not centralizing it, it's decentralizing. And that is the great battle, that no government or none of these multi-government authorities, NGOs, globalist organizations want to do. They want to keep the power, they want to keep us in servitude to them, and they want to keep us in fear. They have no interest in us being liberated. They have interest in us being subservient and stupid. Wow, and very inspirational. I think my next question is, if this were, uh, we were if we were, and we probably are, on the precipice of a revolution, and uh, you had your Patrick Henry moment to give a speech and uh, uh, get all the listeners to understand what the opportunities we have are, and what they should do to move forward in this environment while we have this moment of, uh, of uh, I think at this time, the barn doors of people's brains are open. What should we do? Where, where, tell us what to do, Jeffrey. Let me give you like an, an, an example of how, like with this circumstances with the virus. With this circumstance of the virus, you know, if, if, if we would have had a distributed system of where there was knowledge you know, all over the place. What do you get? You get a whole bunch of people competing to show that they're the smartest, that they got the solution, okay? And what we would do is we'd have a system where people were able to establish, you know, essentially some people would claim to be like an oracle, you know, and that oracle would have a, a ledger that records really, uh, you know, where they could build a reputation on. So, and the reputation would be determined not by force, but by the marketplace valuing their contribution, by being able to analyze their track record and their ideas. And so if you think about, think about how our legal system works, 
think about how we do discovery in this country. Okay, how we do discovery is when we created our jury system. What was the point? Okay, if in the greatest issues of personal liberty, okay, the personal liberty, we basically were only determined to be judged by our peers. Right, that's a jury system. Right. So, what's the role of the judge? The judge in a jury system is not to determine guilt or innocence. The judge in a jury system's only role is to make sure there's a proper discovery of information so that jurors, when they make the decision, they have all the available information in which to make a fair decision. And we rely upon the judgment of the jury. So we don't rely upon the expert, which is the judge. We make a judgment is that the judge is really not expert. Who we rely upon more as experts are the jurors. Okay. So what we have is we have a prosecution and a defense. We even had jury nullification. That's what I'm getting to the point. At the end, also, our founding fathers gave the jurors the right that if they thought that the law was unreasonable, the jury could nullify the law. Okay. That's how much you know, we were designed not as a sovereign nation, but a nation of sovereign people, okay? This is what people forget. People like to indoctrinate us in saying is sovereignty, national sovereignty, okay? That's fucking bullshit, okay? People don't, you know, read the Constitution, read all the documents that surrounded the creation of the Constitution, read all the correspondence for people who were the major people inputting into the drafting of the Constitution, okay? And there was a lot of discussion about this. Okay, the use of the word states and how we organize ourselves and why we had the Bill of Rights. There's, very, there's a very extensive conversation in, uh, regarding all this stuff. And it's and what's it published because these people were great writers. They were debating the most important things. There were people who sit back and said, fuck the monarch. We got rid of King George. We tried the Articles of Confederation. Okay, we're still having some problems. Some people said, maybe we should stick with the Articles. Someone said, no, there's some issues we need to solve. But how do we solve it in a way that we don't become a monarchy, that we don't have tyranny, okay? And that basically we still preserve the sovereign individual, okay? So I think it's a very important distinction that this, we were not created to be a sovereign nation. We were created to be a nation of sovereign individuals, okay? And what we have to do is we have to take back our personal individual sovereignty, okay? This was a system that was designed that the ultimate authority is us. No, no, no fucking asshole in D.C., no one from any administrative agency, okay? It's us, okay? The powers are vested mostly in us, and the role of the Bill of Rights is to protect us against the government. It's not to protect the government. It's to protect us from them. It's to avoid tyranny. I think if Jefferson was alive today, okay, I think the way our government behaves today, and I'm not blaming this uniquely on Trump, so this is not an anti-Trump statement. It's an anti-government statement, so I don't want to be taken as it just attributing it to Trump, because I think we've been a state of tyranny for a pretty long period of time now. But I think if Thomas Jefferson and Patrick Henry were here today, they'd be making the same speeches they made today that they made. You know, if we think about the Patriot Act, what's, what's the difference between us digitally invading our space than having soldiers invade our space, right? You couldn't quarter soldiers. That got the founding fathers pissed off, right? The British were putting soldiers in our house. What the fuck are they doing in our house? It's our property. They can't trespass our property. Isn't the government, through the surveillance of the Patriot Act, surveilling and trespassing us every fucking day? So we, 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 this, is the, this, is, we have, this is, this is, this would meet any founding father's definition of terror, tyranny. If George Washington was here today, John Adams were here today, Jefferson was here today, Patrick Henry was here today, if any of them were here today, they'd probably be making the exact same speeches they made, what, you know, 200 plus years ago. And they would probably have, you know, the same arguments against whatever form of government we had today, because it doesn't look like anything like their, their design. So it's such a perversion of that design, you know, that... Uh, we have to, we should come to the conclusion that this is a failure of, when you make systematically and bad mistakes, in other words, sometimes you have a mistake where somebody makes and that's a random error or some person could just be a moron. 
But when you have a system continually making mistakes, it's in a systematic basis, that's a systemic failure. Okay, we, we should come to the conclusion that we have our government is a systemic failure. Okay, and the systemic failure is not a failure of the Constitution itself with the checks and balances embedded in it. It's the fact is that we got away from the consensus mechanism, which was really about us being sovereign individuals into a centralization of, of, of authority that has now become abusive and we feel completely disenfranchised. So this is what the political class has done, has made everybody, has, has provided an education system to keep them stupid, okay, and, and, has, and they've accumulated power to give everybody the feeling that they're completely disenfranchised. So they've turned the whole country, you know, well, most of the country, into indentured servants. And then the ones that are smart enough to not be indentured servants, they buy off through corrupt legislation, you know, so that they, they basically bribe them through giving them special purposes. So this whole system is so fucking corrupt that we have to take back the power. And I, and I insist the best way of taking back power is not, is not going against violence or anything like that. Reject the money, okay? Reject this fraudulent financial system. And for the only thing people should do with the worship point in, you know, in this country, which is the U.S. dollar, Okay, the gold and, and Bitcoin are significantly better, have better attributes than the shit coin, the U.S. dollar, is only use the U.S. dollar for consumption. Outside of consumption, nobody should keep any money in Wall Street, in banks. You know, people should intermediate savings completely outside the financial system. Okay, if everybody buys Bitcoin and, and on all their savings, okay, and holds gold and buys it and holds it, okay, and has nothing else in the financial system, Basically, now we've destroyed the banks. We can create a decentralized financial system. And no violence was needed to do that. We were just doing it through the market process. We got to not feel fear. Uh, it's, it's the fear that stops us from us feeling empowered. We have the power if we take it back. And it's, and it's not really difficult to take it back. We just need the courage to do so. So if we hold the money, if we hold the money in a way that it's not subject to tax, right? But, you know, Bitcoin is only, you only tax it if you sell it in gold the same way. So if we accumulate wealth in a non-taxable form, only spend it, now we basically starve the government of significant money. Now, whatever the government does, it needs to seek out consent. What we, when the government can print money, what the government is saying is, we can do whatever we want without our consent, without your consent. They've taken consent away from us, okay? That's what the Fed means. The Fed means we don't have to go to you for consent. We're going to sell you the, the concept of this free lunch. Okay. We can spend whatever we want. Okay. And don't worry. You're not going to pay for it. We're just going to give you some money and shut up. Okay. You're not going to live good lives, but you'll live su sufficiently decent lives where you'll just leave us the fuck alone and we'll, be, and we'll take care of the wealthiest in society and we'll help, help make sure that we can organize it in a way where, they, where, they, where you feel in servitude to everyone else. If we really want freedom, we need to, we really need to abolish the Fed. And we don't need the government to abolish the Fed for us. We can abolish the Fed by the choices we make and not saving and don't keeping any money in the bank beyond what you need for necessary payments and don't give anything to Wall Street. If we put a strike against Wall Street, we put a strike against the bank system, save completely outside those systems into decentralized systems, okay? We will have defeated centralized authorities. Okay, we've done it nonviolently and legally by the choices we make. Wow, wow, I'm in. <laughs> well put, please. And you're right. You know, I mean, the, the the people in government. I mean, the congressmen. You know, they get elected. They get the money. They raise money from their families and friends to get elected. And then every two years, they got to run again. They have to run again, so they have to. You know, the lobbyists, they have to get money from the lobbyists because their family, fa friends and family aren't going to give them money every time, you know. So all of a sudden, the whole, so the whole foundation of the system, to me personally, I think it's a little screwed up that our, our uh, congressmen have to beg uh, all year round for money from people and uh, uh, put themselves in a position. We put them in a, uh, in a position that, uh, you know, they could sell us out. And maybe, maybe their terms 
should be a little longer, or maybe they should only have one term, or maybe something. But uh, uh, two years and endless terms is a recipe for disaster, I believe. But uh, my next question is, oh, so because, I mean, when 9-11 happened, when 9-11 happened, we ended up with the Patriot Act. And uh, they threw a bunch of laws in, you know, on, in the bill. They th- everyone threw their stuff in there. They threw things that nobody read in there. And uh, it got passed through real fast. And uh, everyone signed it. It went all the way to the president. The president signed it. So my question is, what type of things do you expect, what type of laws do you expect will be passed because of, uh, you know, this corona thing here? I want to go back to your comments regarding Congress, and then I will then expand into this question. Okay, with respect to Congress, okay, I think when we pass legislation, we should have the equivalent of a blockchain in the sense that we should be able to have providence for every word and every piece of legislation. So in other words, if we have a bill, every citizen has the ability to then basically see all the inputs of that bill and who wrote every word or every sentence in each part of the bill. So if some part was written by some lobbyist, we know which lobbyist wrote that bill and which senator or congressman sponsored that lobbyist and put that lobbyist language's text into that bill. So if we can track the provenance of every, of every aspect of every piece of legislation. You know, then if we had groups that, you know, some think tanks formed that actually went through these bills and could expose all these people who now said that you put this in, we know you put this in, and they're held accountable because, it's, because instead of saying collectively everybody might have voted on it, but we know who the author is. We know providence. So I think it's very important that for every word in every bill, we should know the providence. We should know where it came from. I think then people would be much more careful about the bills they wrote and passed if there was providence associated with every word in the bill. So if they were getting something from a lobbyist, we'd know. If their staff was writing it, we'd know. If some administrative agency body was writing it, we would know. And we would able, we would able to link every, at- every attribute, every aspect of every bill to a specific author. You know, and how it got into the bill, who pushed it, the whole process. So how it moved, who were the people who were pushing those words into a specific bill. So we had that on a ledger that everybody could observe. I could tell you, we get a lot, we, we get a, you know, what do they say about legislation? It's an ugly process and all we should judge is the outcome. That's what they're trying to convince us from is because they know the process is horrible. And they don't want us to blame any individual for it. So they said, you know, you can't really punish all of us for it. So we want to make sure that we all have it, you know, and where, where you don't really get to look inside. And we all have the same incentive for not having anybody look inside because we like the fact that you really can't hold any single individual accountable for every special interest provision and every piece of pork put into any bill. You know, so I think we should push for much more transparency from the government than we do. Uh, They certainly want to monitor us a lot more than they want to be monitored themselves. So it's sad that our own government sees us as enemies, sees every one of us. Well, basically, by the legislation they pass, okay, whenever you hear Pelosi or Mitch McConnell, you know, or Obama or Trump talk, you know that every time while they say they love this country, they actually believe everyone is a potential terrorist. If they didn't believe that, they wouldn't pass the legislation they did to do surveillance on us, okay? So they went and said, we're not sure which one of you are bad actors. So our default position is all of you are bad actors, okay? So, you know, now who knows? We might actually get mandatory vaccines. You know, we might get a passport that if we don't have certain vaccines, we can't go in circulation. What I can guarantee is we're going to get more controls of our, of, over our daily life. We're going to have more surveillance and more controls because the threat now of this is a pandemic. These viruses never go away. It's only going to get worse. The pand- this, is a, this is just a warning. And it, the next one's going to be even worse. So given the fact that the next one is even worse, what's the lesson to be learned is we need to monitor you even more. So, so that's what they're going to sell. And that's all fucking bullshit. So, and it would be 
It would be sad for us to allow ourselves to be so stupid to fall for this bullshit. So, uh, you know, I, that's what they're going to push. We, got, we will get the equivalent of a health care Patriot Act that's going to allow a, 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 an invasion into our lives way beyond what the Patriot Act did. And we actually might have our movement, our freedom of movement, limited forever, potentially, uh, if we don't comply with these rules. And they'll be able to label people, label people an enemy of society if they don't comply with these types of rules because they're putting everybody's health at risk. So this is, and the media is going to cooperate in the selling of all this because if we're all stuck at home, if we're all stuck following their rules, that strengthens their control and authority over us, which is what they don't want challenged. That's pretty scary. It is scary if we don't fight back. If we don't assert ourselves, that's the future. Well, what, what do we have to do? I mean, uh, you said people are out there are listening, but they're very afraid. They might not even think that they should be listening to this podcast, maybe. But what, <laughs> what should people do? How do we, I mean, uh, uh, particular, what particularly, specifically, can we do? All right, we're going to buy and hold Bitcoin, buy and hold gold, support, you know, Politicians that are against this push for legislation. You know, I don't know. What do we do? What do we do? I think supporting the political process is, uh, is uh, I, think, I think every time anybody thinks I'm going to give money to a candidate, my advice is buy more Bitcoin rather than give it to a candidate. Okay. So to no politicians, you know, as, 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 as Ronald Reagan famously said, the most dangerous words in the English language is, you know, I'm from Washington and I'm here to help. So you should remember Ronald Reagan's uh, wise words and uh, that the only that we got to help ourselves. We can't expect anybody to help us. We got to do it for ourselves. So anytime we get an inclination that we're going to that we're going to we're going to enhance our lives by influencing the political process as opposed to accreting wealth, I'd say choose the wealth accretion process. Buy, buy Bitcoin, buy gold, bet against DC, okay? Better bet to bet against DC than for DC. Until the Fed is abolished, it's been a good bet pretty much since the creation of the Fed that betting against the Fed makes money. Instead of Wall Street says, you know, you make money betting with the Fed. Well, I'll tell you, since 2009, if you take a look at the performance of the uh, Bitcoin versus the stock market, Okay, the stock market hasn't come close to performing uh, anywhere as as much as Bitcoin has performed. So stocks keep getting cheaper in terms of Bitcoin, not more expensive in terms of Bitcoin. So the amount of stocks you need to own then now to buy a Bitcoin is much more than the amount, even Amazon. Okay, in 2009, you know, it's versus today, you need with all the appreciation that Amazon has had. You still need to buy more Amazon today to buy one Bitcoin than you did in 2009. So if you take the best performing stocks, and even with the stock market, you know, unless people are really looking at the numbers carefully, uh, the stock market's performance is only really five stocks. Outside of those five stocks, for the last five, six years, corporate earnings as measured by national income accounts have been flat. So we're not necessarily... When we pay more for stocks, we're not paying for the expectation that the earnings will grow. We're just paying a higher price for a dollar of earnings in the future. That's all we're doing. We're paying more for, you know, you know, I'm now what, what, what I used to pay for to get a dollar, you know, a year from now is one price. Now the price I'm willing to pay to get a dollar a year from now has gone up. So all we're doing is we're bidding up the price to receive the same amount of money in the future. And what we're seeing is, like, for the first time now, that in, 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 that in at least the last 25, 30 years, uh, if you take the top five stocks, uh, their percentage of the market cap of the S&P 500 is over 20%. So one-fifth of the, uh, of the S&P 500 is just the five stocks, which is the, uh, the MAGA plus F stocks. Some people refer to it as Microsoft, um, Amazon, Google, Apple. And Facebook. In the beginning of this year, before the stock market sold off, 
about 80, 90 percent of the total return in the market was just because of that stocks. Uh, you can basically see in the absence of those stocks, the stock market has been actually pretty flat, uh, you know, and it hasn't gone up very much. So what we have is we have an economy where the Fed is keeping interest rates low. So we redistribute wealth from poor people to middle class to the wealthiest elements of society. Um, we have companies having their stock prices go up without their, without their corporate performance being any better, actually in many cases worse. Uh, and we have a greater concentration of economic power and political power that is perverting not only our economic system, you know, but our political system. And during this whole period of time, we've had very limited productivity growth. In the past, when we had recessions and we recovered from recessions, we had a lot of new business formation, you know, and, and we had a, um, a better distribution of value uh, in the stock market. It hasn't been concentrated in so few stocks. So what we have evidence of is a few companies have an exorbitant amount of economic power. And that's not healthy. And it's not healthy for both the productivity of the economy and the distribution of how that productivity is shared because if basically I'm a monopolist, it means the people who are the suppliers of capital basically can strip out most of the value for themselves because there isn't really a competitive market. So they have significant amount of bargaining power. So we have a system right now that's been designed where most people's bargaining power has been diluted. And as a consequence of having their bargaining power diluted, their economic outcomes are significantly worse off. And this is something that is not adequately addressed in any economic textbooks today, because our economic textbooks all assume perfectly competitive markets, and they don't do a very good job when they're not perfectly competitive markets, and that the lack of competitive markets, to a great extent, is driven by government creating barriers to entry or the financial system creating barriers to entry. So it's a combination of the financial system with government that create barriers to entry that deters competition and that deters our ability to create economic wealth, except for just a few. So we don't have a capitalist system anymore and we don't have a constitutional republic. What we need to do is hopefully is convince more people that this is, you know, I, a lot of times I've spoken to people who say, you know, like some people, simple minded people were saying, you know, early on that this election between Trump and and, uh, and, 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 and if it was going to be uh, Bernie Sanders, was a debate between capitalism and socialism. Okay, that's a, that's a lie. Okay, you know, someone sits back and says, if, if I have a minimum wage of $8, that's capitalism. But if I, raise, if I raise the minimum wage to $10, that's socialism. So the capital system, if, if, I, if, I, provide, if I provide Medicare or, health, or some health care or national savings to X percentage of the population, that's capitalism. But if I double it, that's socialism. So it's such a really stupid debate, because it's, and, it's, and it's a false debate. We don't live in a capitalist country. If you take a look, read, people should read, check out the 1928 uh, socialist platform. There are 10, 11 items in that socialist platform. And if you read what the aspirations of the socialists were in 1928, they basically got everything they had, that they wanted back in 1928. So what we used to consider capitalism, we don't consider capitalism anymore. You know, we, we live in a mixed economy with heavy interference by the government. Government rules grow every single day. And a lot of the decisions, one time I was doing a negotiation with a, with a, with a labor union that was complaining about, you know, the wage cuts. I was doing this on behalf of a friend. So his business was suffering and he asked me to come in and negotiate concessions and I was negotiating against the uh, United Steel Workers Union. And when they said to me they didn't get wet, they didn't get pay increases, I said, yes, you did. I said, you just haven't seen in your pocket the government has captured it. The government has created all these rules. And I'm going to right now show you how much it costs. One is how much money you put in your pocket. The other is how much it costs the company to actually hire you. Okay. So it has to take a look at all the compliance courses, hiring with you, the possibility of all these type of things you can sue them for, all the paperwork they have to comply with, all the benefits they have to give you. So you can't look at your compensation as what you get to, what's they, what is your paycheck. You got to take the U.S. compensation as what the company is paying to hire you. That's your compensation. 
So the distribution of the compensation between what the government is, what the company is paying to hire you and what you get to keep in that pocket, that's a, that's a consequence of the government, not the company. If, if basically your salary is, you know, $600 and the company's paying $100, you know, to give you, you know, it, it, it giving you $1,000, it's paying $1,000 to give you 600 I can tell you the company would much prefer to give you 1000 than give 600 to you and have the other 400 the other things they're paying on your behalf or compliance costs associated with their with their with the ability to hire you. So the fact that the fact that 40% of your salary is not going to you is not a decision the company's making, it's a decision the government is making. And the fact is they're determining not only they're determining basically the allocation of your income between compliance costs, rules and regulations, benefit, mandatory benefits, and then ultimately you have. So those decisions are not made by the company hiring you, they're made by the government. If you don't like the distribution of that, don't blame the company, blame the government. So the government has, keeps on raising the cost of hiring people. So the employer doesn't see, the, the employee doesn't see the cost to the employer of hiring that individual, but the employee, employer is bearing that cost. So that has a consequences on labor markets. So we create all these rules to deter competition, which drives wages down. We, do, we, we, we create all these costs of hiring people further drive wages down. And we subsidize capital and we punish labor. So that encourages more companies to substitute technology for human beings. So the government has done all this stuff. Um, but because people haven't learned basic economic theory and whatever economics they are learned, they're learned by economists who most of their money is, most of their research is funded by the Fed. So they're all mouthpieces for government bullshit because whatever research they need to do is either, is either coming from some federal government agency or it's coming from the Fed. So what, how, how neutral do you think they are in research? You know, they got to basically do the research that's going to get funded. So and the government's only going to fund the research that they want them to fund. So we only know what the government wants us to know. And what the government doesn't want us to know doesn't get funded. So this is all really, the whole system is evil. And we really need to wake up. And I don't really know what it takes to get more people waking up. I mean, that's why I'm doing, you know, this interview now. I, I get no financial benefit from this. I'm not attempting to be an influencer that's selling my reputation and looking to, you know, um, get compensated by getting ad dollars or anything like that. So this conversation between you and I doesn't put a dollar in my pocket, uh, either directly or indirectly put a dollar in my pocket. You know, so this is my effort is, you know, uh, and, and, and I'm just a nobody, really. Uh, I mean, nobody, very few people know who I am. But this is, the, this is the effort I'm making to hopefully wake people up. Well, uh, I always enjoy our conversation. And I, know, I knew, and I know that we have to get your words out there because uh, people have forgotten or maybe never have even learned the things that uh, they should learn, that even have a foundation to be able to listen to, to the wonderful uh, guidance that you're providing here. I think a question, uh, or two questions maybe, is let's say we had an incredible crystal ball and we could make everything we want happen and uh, uh, into the future where we're going to see everything that we want. Every, you're going to see everything that you want within a, a time uh, that's reasonable. What, like which countries are going to overprint and fail. Their currency is going to fail. And what's going to happen? Let's say in this inevitable, incredible future that we're going to put forth, uh, that you're going to tell us uh, what's going to happen where we're finally in this uh, uh, crypto utopia where we deserve to be. What are the things that happen in, in this timeline that's about to come up if everything went our way? Well, I think things are going our way. I think... I think the uh, I think the reasons why central authorities are trying to uh, instill greater and greater fear in us is that they know they're losing the battle. So they knew they know they need more instruments of coercion over us, 
and they know they need to monitor us uh, more aggressively so they can basically isolate from society anyone they deem as a threat. So, uh, you know, I got to assume that, you know, from, uh, uh, you know, from the things like I say, you know, I I'm probably considered a virus. And if what I say, a few other people then repeat, you know, then basically, you know, I or somebody else becomes the source of a pandemic of spreading this virus of, you know, to the operating system of this corrupt system. So I think I think the system knows its rule is fragile and every fiat money regime has failed. Th this government has more power as a um, as a reserve currency of the world to basically extend its life. But if you take a look at like the pound sterling, the after World War One, the UK was pretty much at the feet of empire. But the pound sterling reserve maintained its reserve status for another 30 years, even when it became, even when it was becoming an economic basket case. So I think that uh, we are seeing the beginning of the end of the American empire. I think, I think in a perverse way, the, the nationalism, and I don't think that's at all the intention, but I think the nationalist movement is going to accelerate. Uh, and I'm not definitely not a globalist. So I want to be clear, I'm not a globalist. I don't like any of these global institutions. But I think the feeling of the type of nativist, nationalist movement that we see now is going to actually accelerate uh, the longer term weakness of the United States, not strengthen it. So, um, uh, you know, so I think this process in the short run will have a more onerous government over us. But the history of human society has been is that when government goes far, you know, people, the question is, does the government have enough elements, you know, to basically keep us in servitude forever? And I guess in that respect, I'm an optimist. I don't think that's the case. I think people uh, will rebel in a legal, you know, uh, uh, nonviolent way. I certainly don't encourage anyone to do anything illegal, but uh, or any act of violence I would never condone. But I think people will decide that they've had enough. And people will start doing actions like rejecting the dollar, like in many other countries where they reject their own national currencies. And people will adopt other forms of exchanging value uh, other than, uh, you know, the, the national currencies. And once that happens, those, those national governments will then first try and use some force. But at the end, they won't even be able to sustain the force because they won't have enough money to continue to pay the people who they rely upon for sustaining the force, you know, and eventually uh, the people's will will prevail. So I'm optimistic that eventually the people's will prevail. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I think that government is well on the way to pushing people, you know, beyond the point of no return, where people will make sure their will prevails. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that will, that'll happen here. So, and I'm optimistic as a consequence of that, you know, my gold and Bitcoin will be worth a lot more. So, and the dollar will be worth significantly a lot less. And I will also be happy with the fact that all these corrupt crony systems will find that how they stored wealth that they've enjoyed for a period of time is going to be fine, that it's going to be worth a lot less or worthless. And the younger generation have said, we've had enough. You know, there's a concept called odious debt, okay? So what is odious debt? You know, if, if, if I basically borrow money without the really the consent of the people and the money is not used to create wealth for subsequent generations, that that subsequent generation that inherits that debt says, you spent money for your benefit and you're passing the bill on to me, so I have the right to renounce that debt. Okay, so there's actually... a legal term called odious debt. So I think all the debt we're creating today is odious. So I think we have the, young, the younger generation right now that says, I don't want to pay their student loans. I certainly don't agree with that. You know, you go to college, it's a human capital loan. So just walking away from your debt that you made a decision to consciously get yourself, nobody should walk away from. Nobody's put a gun to anyone's head and said, go to college, you know, go to a shitty school, learn little, 
and then expect society has an obligation because you made a poor investment cap, a human capital decision that you have to socialize the consequence of your poor human capital decision. So no, their human capital decision, they got to live with the consequences of it. But the type of debt that we, that we have had with all the promises that we've made to pay people that we don't have the money to pay, when we go to the next generation who sees that we have a fucked up economy, that they're earning very little, uh, and yet they're going to have to figure out government has had more ways of taxing them, whether it's direct taxes or indirect taxes, you know, fees and other things, you know, that they're going to sit back and say, no, I'm not going to pay this. So we've defaulted on debt before. And when we, when we, when we uh, removed, when Roosevelt removed gold clauses uh, from contracts, that was at the basement of debt of an order of magnitude of about 40% of the face value of the debt because we forced people to take a form of compensation that was 40%, uh, that, was, that was basically 60% of the value of the claim that they legitimately had that the government took away from them. So we've already defaulted on the debt when we, when we, when we abrogated gold clauses and contracts you know, during the Roosevelt administration. So we'll be aggravating co- contracts uh, and younger people are going to wake up and say, you know, I, I don't, I, this system I'm not betting on. I'm going to bet on Bitcoin. And they, they will become the new millionaires. And the 1% today, uh, 10 years from now, might find themselves nowhere near, not even in the top 50% because of the way they've made the decision to store wealth. So I'm hoping that Bitcoin will become uh, not only the reserve currency of the world, uh, but the means on which we will significantly uh, alter uh, the allocation of wealth, you know, in a proof of work system. Uh, so that's that's my hope for the future. And I think there's a strong possibility that that will be the future. Very nice. Very nice. So I have one more thing. Um, let's say we wrangle up everyone again. We run you for president, and we win. What are you going to do? Uh, I don't want to be president. Too bad. Too bad. You have to be. Let's say you're going to be. <laughs> the people who want to be should never be. So let's say we made you president. Uh, what do you do first day? Uh, first day, what I do is any bureaucratic agency that I can shut down through executive order, I shut down. So... Uh, you know, I want to liberate the people. So whatever would be, I, I don't know which things I can get done through executive order, but whatever I can get done in executive order, like I could basically fire the IRS and basically just announce that, well, I can't change the income tax code. I can't make sure nobody has ever ordered it. So, uh, you know, maybe that would be the first thing I would do is I would end, uh, you know, all people's you know, I would propose to abolish the income tax, but to the extent that I couldn't succeed, I could basically just eliminate the IRS and I would eliminate every government agency that I had the authority to eliminate on my own. And to the extent that I couldn't find civil servants, I could I could see whether I could create an executive order, you know, basically, uh, uh, you know, not uh, uh, not uh, not to enforce the tax code. So if a politician from the Senate or Congress wants to then sue me through the Supreme Court and basically saying I'm not complying with my presidential duties, let them do that. And let's see how popular they are in basically, you know, basically telling people, you know, that they should be against the, the person who basically says, I can't abolish the tax code, but I can make sure you don't have to pay taxes. You know, and then where these people will figure out how to pay their salaries then, then maybe they'll be forced to sell off government assets so they can fund themselves. And to the extent that I can, and, the, and that I would, I would be happy because I'd be happy to sell off all the assets that the government has. Uh, to the extent that I had the authority to pull out troops out everywhere in the world, uh, that could be done through executive order. I would basically bring all our troops home everywhere. I, I know that presidents can't impound funds that whatever the government you know, that there's been efforts in the past that when Congress passes a, a budget, that you basically have to spend the budget, you know, that Congress passes. But, I, you know, I would do my best to veto every single congressional bill brought to my desk. 
and require every bill to, to get a two thirds vote to override all my vetoes. So I would veto everything Congress did, everything that was not eliminating government, eliminating, abolishing the income tax, you know, and ending the Fed. If anything outside that purview, I would veto everything. So an appeal to the American public to support that. Very good, very good. What about the currency? What are you going to do with the? Immediately, uh, I guess the president has the authority uh, to basically create currency competition. So uh, if you can't, you know, I guess there's issues of can the president have as many members of the board of governors uh, and basically that control the board of governors. If I can control the board of governors, you know, to the extent that I couldn't abolish the Fed, I would appoint, uh, but you need congressional approval for the board of governors. So it could be a problem getting Congress to approve the board of governors. But to the extent that I could uh, authorize gold and, and, and basically abolish legal tender laws, I would attempt to abolish all legal tender laws. So if I can't, kill the dollar as a national currency, I could certainly allow current country, all current other currencies to compete against the to compete against the dollar and give people the freedom of choice. And I would be every day, I would be trying to convince people that the dollar is a shit coin and try and continue to extend my argument that my effort is to liberate people. Uh, they cannot be liberated if there's a national currency. The fact, I would remind them uh, daily, uh, you know, that would be my daily press briefing, would be reading documents written by the founding fathers on why we're a constitutional republic, why we didn't have the government the right to mint money, what the founding fathers thought about democracy as opposed to a constitutional republic, and why they thought it was important that the greatest instrument of tyranny was the government control of the printing press. So I would use the power of my bully pulpit to basically educate the people, not on my words, but the words of the people who are responsible for our founding documents. So I would read their words every day, not mine, their words every day. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think uh, our time's up, but uh, it's been incredible. I think uh, everyone should listen to this podcast over and over and over and feel emboldened by your words and uh, your vision and your clarity. Because many people, um, they feel certain things and uh, they know uh, a few things, but like you, nobody knows it like you, Jeffrey. So that's why I needed you on here. And uh, a few last words and, uh, and that's going to be about it. Well, thank you, Nick. I enjoy every opportunity of speaking with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you guys so much uh, for tuning in to this episode. This was absolutely incredible. This is exactly the type of content um, that the people need to hear right now. So make sure you guys keep up to date with our website, blockchaincenter.com. Our daily schedule is absolutely packed. Every day we're bringing you guys new content, new live content. And make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Miami. That's where all of our content goes live. And we are proud to be partnered up with Podtext to bring you guys the best podcasting resources available. Uh, if you'd like to host your own podcast with us, you can visit podtext.com slash Miami to learn more. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Stay safe out there and have a great night. Take care. Make sure to tune into our cryptos.com minute news podcast where we bring you the latest crypto news in just a few short minutes. Hello and welcome, guys, to our first ever Blockchain Center Minute News Update podcast sponsored by Cryptos.com. Today is April 20th, 2020, and it's been an absolutely crazy day, guys. As most of you probably know by now, the price of oil has completely tanked at least for the futures contract of May for West Texas Intermediate. Um, the price right now is at negative $23.60, a change of negative 229% on the day. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like the oil catastrophe has dragged down stock markets and Bitcoin a little bit. 
Bitcoin right now is bouncing back and forth from 6.8 to 6.9K right now. As of the time of this recording, it's trading a little bit over 6,800. Three news stories for us to cover today. Uh, The first one involving uh, everyone's favorite project from Facebook, Libra, of course. Facebook plans to hire 50 people in Ireland for its Libra project. The Irish Times reported this news on Monday, saying that the new jobs would spread across various functions and some of them are already open for application. Moving forward, the $75 billion hedge fund Renaissance Technologies is eyeing the Bitcoin futures market. Um, As per a regulatory filing, the fund said its well-known medallion funds would be able to buy Bitcoin futures on the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Renaissance Technologies, it's one of the largest hedge funds in the world. Pretty crazy. $75 billion is uh, no joke. And lastly, uh, this has been a a popular topic over the last few days. The $25 million hack uh, from Uniswap and Lendf.me. The hacker is believed to have used an exploit shared on GitHub last year to steal these funds from both platforms. It's a real, real sad story. I know some people have been poking fun at the DeFi network and have been cracking jokes about this. But guys, when one project suffers, it kind of brings us all down. So no matter if you're on Team Bitcoin, Team Ethereum, Team DeFi, you know, we're all part of the bigger picture here. Team Crypto versus, you know, the state controlled dirty unsound fiat system. So we're all in this together. But thank you guys for tuning in to our first ever Blockchain Center Minute News podcast. We appreciate you guys. Everyone stay safe out there. Take it easy. Strategically located in downtown Miami's emerging business district, the Blockchain Center is the premier hub of the Americas for teaching, networking, and building the distributed future. Our mission is to manifest the mass adoption of blockchain technology and onboard the next 6 billion people to the global monetary revolution.